I like to know him. Are you ready for more? Yeah. DJ. Baby, you Put your hands up. 1970. All the wheels are still at this time. Hip hop grandfather Africa Bambata starts to DJ. Yeah, just hit me. B-boying, aka Breakin', makes his first appearances in the clubs. To become a B-boy, you have to. It's like you've already made a commitment to the, to it as an art form. 1973, Cool Herc, the father of hip hop, born Clive Campbell, DJed his first block party at a park near his home. He played soul, old funk, and R&B records on his turntables. Originally from Jamaica, Herc brought his knowledge of the Jamaican sound system scene to the Bronx. It was about me holding on to my, you know, my roots. 1974. Lovebug Starsky coins the phrase hip-hop in his lyrics. He used to always, you know, say to the hip-hop, you don't stop. 1975, DJ Grand Wizard Theodore invents the scratch while trying to hold a record in place while his mother was yelling at him. 1977, hey, you, the, rock crew. the rock steady crew established by Bronx B-Boys Jimmy D and JoJo. The gangs in the early 70s, they settled their, their differences with violence. We settled our differences with dancing. 1979. The Sugar Hill Gang records a song called Rapper's Delight. This is the first commercial single on Sugar Hill Records. The rap that we did was a fun type, you know. And every time we got on stage, everybody had a ball. 1980. This was a big moment when it comes to the crossover. So the people in Blondie actually met Fab Five Freddy and some others during the whole Mud Club era, and they were thus inspired. So lead singer Debbie Harry actually raps on the Blondie single, Rapture. Fab Five Freddy told me everybody's side. DJ spinning, I said, my, my. 1982. Push me. Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five released the message on Sugar Hill Records, and that track peaked at number four on the music charts. After the message, you know, we figured out that you can't get serious now. I guess everybody figured it out. We 1984. So you got a couple of guys going to school in New York City and decided to start a record label out of their dorm room. One was named Rick Rubin, and the other was Russell Simmons. And of course, we got Def Jam. We always made music that was colorblind and um, brought this music to the masses. In Los Angeles, a radio station called KDAY became the first rap-only radio station in the world. 1986, Run DMC released a hip-hop version of Aerosmith's Walk This Way, and all of a sudden, hip-hop broke out of the pop charts, MTV, and mass media all at once. It ain't like we set out to say, all right, we're going to make rock records to get a rock crowd. We just go and we make what we make. And like Jay said, we just do what was done before rap records was made. No more battling. You've been taken out. The Juice Crew released a song called The Bridge. Boogie Down Productions responded with a song called The Bridge Is Over. And that started one of the longest running beef battles in hip hop history. 1987. The bridge is over. This is the year that Boogie Down Productions put out their masterpiece album called Criminal Minded. Scott LaRock and KRS One made up BDP. And then later that year, LaRock is shot and killed in the Bronx as he tries to break up a dispute. His death sparks KRS One to shift his focus to more positive lyrics. I'm not a front. I'm not going to front to the public. I'm not going to front to you. And I'm not going to front to me. 1989. Fight the power. Public Enemy releases It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, revitalizing conscious rap. We're trying to build upon the young, and we're trying to use the rap music that we that we specialize in. NWA Records, Straight Outta Compton, goes gold, popularizing the gangsta school of rap. There was this collective kicking around called Native Tongues Posse, and a part of that was a group called The Tribe Called Quest. They released Description of a Fool. The group promotes the Afrocentricity movement, which sets out to make African Americans aware of their heritage. The hip hop right now is just washed up commercialized and all that stuff, you know. And that's what we wanted to stay away from. 1993. It's like this and like that and like this. And Dr. Dre goes platinum with his album The Chronic. And while it wasn't the first gangster rap record, it sure started that bandwagon. 1994. Nas, the Wu-Tang Clan, and Black Moon all released debut albums, completely revitalizing East Coast rap. First things first. The Source magazine has a column called Unsigned Hype. This is the year that Christopher Wallace, a.k.a. Notorious B.I.G., is featured. Former Source editor Matty C. plays Biggie's tape for Puffy. Puffy then signs the young rapper. His single, One More Chance, from the debut album Ready to Die, debuts at number one, and the album goes multi-platinum. 1996. On September the 7th, Tupac is shot in Las Vegas, Nevada, after watching a Mike Tyson fight. He dies in hospital on September the 13th. His murder remains unsolved. I think Tupac had, like, if not the biggest, one of the biggest influences ever to hip-hop music.
Bone Thugs and Harmony break the record for fastest rising single with their hit The Crossroads. Who held that spot before? Ah, some little track called Can't Buy Me Love from some band called The Beatles. 1997. March 9th, Notorious B.I.G. is gunned down while leaving a star-studded Vibe magazine party after the Soul Train Music Awards. The murder remains unsolved. 1998. Dr. Dre hears some rapper freestyling on a Los Angeles radio station, and he decides to sign him to his Aftermath label. That rapper's name? Eminem. And the Slim Shady LP is released, and within a matter of weeks, it went to number two on the Billboard charts. We're both perfectionists. I think that's one of the reasons why the records come out as good as they do. 1999. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame finally honors hip-hop legends with a hip-hop museum and conference. The culture has moved forward even further. You know, it's like the idea is that whenever a pioneer steps a, for a step forward, then all the people just, you know, follow. 2001. Now, despite the fact that he'd been dead for many years, Tupac clearly had a lot of songs. His posthumous album, Until the End of Time, debuted at number one on the album charts. The release puts Pac's career sales at over 33.5 million records sold. This gives him the distinction of being the best-selling rap artist of all time. He would always feel the words he would say. 2003. It's 50. So Dre finds Eminem, and then Dre and M find 50 Cent. He releases Get Rich or Die Trying at the top of the Billboard album chart. It breaks records as the highest-selling debut album of all time, with sales of almost 900,000 copies in the first week alone, and over 5 million since its release. Things are happening kind of fast for me, so if I don't look like I don't understand what's going on, <laughs> it's because I don't understand what's going on. The U.S. Congress created a library called the National Recording Registry to preserve recordings of historical and cultural significance. 2003 saw the first rap recording enter. Grandmaster Flash and Furious Fives, The Message. If I die tomorrow, it's like, wow. Thing is really going a long way. For the first time in Billboard chart history, all top 10 slots in the countdown are held by urban artists. And of those top 10, nine of them are rappers. The mainstream success is only, you know, showing that hip hop grows, you know what I mean? It just grows and grows. According to Forbes in 2003, Dr. Dre and Eminem tied as the second most powerful celebrities in the world. Dr. Dre, for his part, is also the second highest paid performer in the world. You're never going to see me on, like, VH1's Behind the Music or something like that, <laughs> being broke.